Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is the uh, Center for Spiritual Transformations Second Saturday Spirituality of Sharing. And we are very blessed to have with us today, Elisa Hansen, uh, giving a presentation on the sacred and the worldly. Does a work of art need to be religious to be spiritual? Most of us know Elisa as our deacon where she has served at St. Boniface for five years now. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a secret life of Elisa too. She serves as the, I wanna get your position right, the um, Art Research Library Director at Ringling, uh, Ringling Museum. Mm -hmm. She has also served as a museum curator, a museum educator, an art research librarian, both here and in Denmark and at uh, several colleges here in Florida. So we are very, um, very fortunate. We couldn't be in better hands for this morning. And I'm very much looking forward to what you will have to share with us, Elisa. So I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. And before I put the uh, slides on the screen, uh, let's have a short prayer. Gracious God, thank you for the blessing of all of us being together this, this morning and fellowship. We pray that you will be with us as we think about how the creative work of others can bring us closer to you and to all of the rest of humanity. Grant us peace as we enjoy each other's company and the opportunity to share ideas and, and our thoughts. May this prayer be as incense in your sight. Amen. Now I will see if this works and hope that it does. And it does. So let me start. Um, oops. I'm trying to get the image. There it is. Okay, good enough. Okay, so this, um, since Reed is here, if you don't mind, I'll tell everyone how this, this subject sort of came up. Um, Rita had found in the museum shop at the Ringling this book called Dangerous Women. Um, and it is <clears throat> a little exhibition catalog that was written in conjunction with an exhibition from of Ringling Works uh, that circulated around the state of Florida. And <laughs> the, all of the pictures in it are paintings that deal with women who have done dangerous things, okay, biblical stories, some, uh, some of which are rather nefarious. Uh, Salome is in there, but others like Judith and um, uh, who was trying to uh, save her people. Um, so that kind of led to our discussion about religious versus spiritual and maybe sometimes in the same work the same. Uh, and so I thought I would put together some works that um, will help us to start thinking about how certain religious works are inspirational to our um, spiritual life and others maybe are not. And then we'll look at some secular works that uh, also hopefully will do that for us. So uh, let me just jump ahead here, let's see, to a, a few quotes. And let's see, I'm gonna put the pictures at the bottom of the screen. You may wanna do that so that you can see better. I found a quote by Thomas Burton. And since I love his writings, I decided to include that. And he said, I do not insist on this division between spirituality and art. For I think that even things that are not patently spiritual, if they come from the heart of a spiritual person are spiritual. Uh, and I like that very much. And then from a Zen master, uh, D.T. Suzuki, he states, art is studied in Japan, not only for art's sake, but for spiritual enlightenment. We believe art is always connected to spirituality. It is one of the ways we become truly alive. And finally, from an author, I don't know, I don't know this source, the mind, the light, but he wrote, or she perhaps wrote, artists have long known that being attuned to the light, the ability to see deeply connects us with the holy in a fresh and new way. And we'll see a few works that, that deal with art. And so there's a connection there to what we're going to talk about. I mean, we know that 
Art has been used for religious practices for a long, long time as part of worship. We've seen that in the catacombs from the very beginning of, of Christian worship. And even further back, if you go to the rock carvings of Northern Europe or the cave paintings of Spain or France, you see that they were part of the pagan rituals at that time as well. But what are the images that inspire our own personal spirituality? We know that art always conveys the human emotions in some way or another and can elicit emotions from within us. Art can calm us, uh, can put us in a more contemplative state or mood. And we'll, I think we'll see some things today that, that may fall into that category. It can help us to be, become more silent so that we can focus on something specific, perhaps something of beauty. Uh, think about the icons that are often used in the um, Eastern Orthodox Church. And it can also remind us of God's creation and its beauty. <clears throat> and I'm going to share something uh, of a personal nature with you uh, uh, that falls into that category. So given the fact that I've said it doesn't have to be religious to be spiritual, I chose these two paintings of the same subject. And, and as you can see, I'm sure they, it is the, uh, the Supper at Emmaus by two different artists. The one on the left is Renaissance, the one on the right is Baroque. <clears throat> and, I, and I feel that there is such a contrast between the way that the artist approached this particular subject. And I want you to think about which of these inspire you and your own faith and your own spirituality. And then maybe you can share some of your comments with us. On the left is a painting by a 16th century Italian painter, Carpaccio. Uh, and if you're wondering what the relationship might be between his name and uh, an, a well-known Italian dish, Carpaccio, which of course is a, a marinated a raw red meat that's sliced very thinly and is quite delicious. It's because the dish was named after the artist. In, in almost all of his paintings, he uses a, a deep red color you don't see that so much in this, but there's there's always a red in his composition. So because of the red meat, uh, the Italians named that dish Carpaccio, just as a little uh, sidelight to this. Anyway, he was late 15th century, and uh, this particular painting on the left hangs in the Church of St. Salvador in Venice. <clears throat> and it is meant to depict that moment when Cleophas, who is on the left, the far left of this uh, composition, and another companion along the way meet Jesus on the way to Emmaus and then sit down to, to eat with him. So in both of these paintings, this is meant to be that particular moment when suddenly the two men realize who this is, that this is in fact Jesus. But as you can see, it's depicted in, in, in two very, very different ways. The one on the left is a beautiful, symmetrical, uh, detailed, organized painting, typical of the Renaissance. It's very, it's, but it's very staid. It's very um, sort of frozen. And we see Christ blessing, uh, giving a blessing. <clears throat> and we see, we don't really see too much surprise on the part of these two men. And we also see that Carpaccio is doing a little bit of showing off because uh, I find this guy, the Turk in the, on the left in the turban, a little bit of, a, of a, an element that he has, I think, included to impress, but, but may not necessarily uh, be appropriate to the composition. So then on the right, we have a painting from 1601 by Caravaggio. And if you know anything about Caravaggio, he probably led the least religious life of any painter during the 16th or 17th century that we know of. Uh, he was constantly in trouble, beating people up in taverns. Um, he got in a, an argument with someone over a tennis match and killed him and then had to flee. Uh, his favorite pastime was, was spending evenings in the, the bordellos of Rome. Uh, so he wasn't exactly a devout man, but we see a very different approach to his Supper at Emmaus here. We see uh, the two men, uh, Cleophas and his companion, 
in a state of absolute shock when they realize that this is in fact Jesus. Uh, the, the man on the right is just throwing his arms out to the side in, in utter surprise. The man on the left is reaching down to the, to the arms of the chair because he's about to stand up. He's so surprised that he can't even stay seated. And then of course the servant in the back has no idea what's going on. But it's a very dramatic scene. It's, it's the typical uh, dramatic use of light and dark that Caravaggio always uh, utilized, but uh, two very different approaches. So they're both religious, but which one would inspire you more? Um, uh, if anybody would like to speak, um, please feel free to do that. Well, let's go on. The to one the on the right. Yeah. Elisa, I'm seeing one hand ra uh, raised. Uh, Michael, you had a, oh, and okay. maybe Jane, you had a question. It's Rita. Um, um, I'm sorry, I can't find the hand thing. Um, I just wanted to say that the one on the right, the dramatic light and the dramatic um, figure uh, attitude of the pose, I think is sort of more eye-catching, you know, at, I mean, it sort of draws you into the, the subject. You immediately become part of the painting. I think that's a very important point because actually in Baroque painting, that is one of the very typical approaches that you are meant to feel as, you're, as though you are right there, that you are on the same picture plane with the figures and that you're experiencing what they're experiencing. So that, that was a very good observation, absolutely. Can I go next? Yeah, let's. Okay. Um, the, the Carpaccio on the left is almost disturbing to me because it's, it's, it's as if Christ is sitting on a throne and very removed. He's not close to the people. What I like that I had never noticed before in the other, in the other painting is that Christ cast a shadow and mm -hmm. I, I really like that. It's an indication of how alive he is rather than this um, one dimensional kind of cutout. Um, it gave him a, a depth, which for me spiritually is, is very important. You know, the depth that Christ has in our life every day, the reality that he is still alive and among us is an important part of my spiritual journey. So I, I favor the one on the right. I vote for the one on the right. <laughs> well, those are excellent observations. I, I, I echo what you were saying. Uh, good points, both of you. Well, you know, sometimes a, uh, a work of art, even though it's religious uh, in subject matter, uh, really has some undertones to it and some history that may surprise most people who look at it. And I chose this one to show you because it, it's not really what meets the eye if you were to be standing in front of it and, and, uh, and looking at it. This is called, the painting is called the Charter House of Bruges. And the reference is to the uh, monastery of the Carthusians in Bruges, uh, today's Belgium. And uh, it was commissioned by the man that you see kneeling to your left in the habit of that order. His name is Jan Vos. And when we first look at this, we think, oh, this is a very sweet, typically Northern Renaissance um, painting by, by Von Eyck is the uh, artist's name. Uh, he did it just at the time when he passed away and his studio completed it for him. Um, it is indicative of the, the very jewel-like approach and the wonderful uh, deep colors that, that came from the illuminated manuscripts uh, of, of Northern Europe before they turned to painting on panels instead of, of vellum in books. And you can see the city of Bruges in the background. You can see the canals, you can see uh, the a spire of a church. And, and if you could, if you were standing in front of it, you would even see sheep on the hills and, and so forth. Uh, so it's very detailed and, and uh, the Virgin Mary in the middle with the Christ child has jewels on her, her garments that, um, that are quite spectacular. 
So Jan Voss is kneeling with his hands in prayer and with her hand on his shoulder is St. Elizabeth, who is his patron saint, and excuse me, St. Barbara. And then on the right is St. Elizabeth. And we know that this, that she, the, that Barbara is a, um, a martyr because she's holding the sheaf of, of uh, a palm leaf uh, that is uh, indicative of, of her position as a martyr. And because she was kept in a tower before her martyrdom, we see a tower directly behind her through the arch of that, that opening. But what we don't know when we first look at this this very devout man uh, in prayer in front of the, the Virgin Mary and the Christ child is that this painting is what is called a devotional indulgence painting. So in, in reality, it's all about the man who commissioned it. He commissioned it because at that point in history in Northern Europe, you, if you commissioned a painting of a highly religious nature, then you could presumably according to the Roman church at that time, uh, limit your time in purgatory. So you would, you would get into heaven a lot faster. So he is the patron of the painting. Everybody is supposed to see that. Uh, it's supposed to help him to give him this spiritual wealth that he wouldn't have if he was not able to afford to commission the painting and so on. So knowing this, uh, what impact does it have on your viewing of the painting? Or even if you knew that, could you put it aside and say, because of my belief as a Christian, this, this inspires me? Um, Elisa, I, I just, I need to cycle back to Grace. She had her hand raised before we moved on to the next sure. set of slides. So uh, she has her hand raised and uh, Grace, are you there? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I was referring to the Caravaggio in the last uh, slide. The, the Caravaggio uh -huh. painting. Uh huh. And uh, how much more alive and emotional it was in the painting of the subject of the subjects of the humans human beings that were there and the coloring was was just struck you as much more of a, an eventful uh, occasion and painting. I, I just, I thought we were all saying the same thing about it. That's all. And who, could I ask who the artist is of this one here, the, the chart house of Bruges? That is Jan von Eyck. Never heard of him. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments about this before we go on? I am not seeing any hands raised, Elisa. All right. So, um, this is a photograph, and I want to remind you that photographs can be just as spiritually enhancing for us uh, as, as paintings or sculpture or any other art form. Um, this this photograph is, is one of my, uh, not one that I took, one my daughter took, but the story behind it is, is a highly personal one that I wanted to share with you. And, you know, it's interesting because when I think back on when I was going through discernment uh, for the diaconate, one of the questions that I seem to always be asked in, in all of the interviews was, well, what, what, spirit, what, what enhances your spirituality? What, to, to what do you turn? Um, and uh, I invariably answered nature, because when I'm out in God's creation, that's where I feel very much uh, at home with God and close to God. So this is a photograph of um, uh, the area near where I lived in Denmark. I could literally step out of my home and within a, just a couple of minutes be in the forests. And these forests are very special because uh, in them, and literally under the foundation of my home, was the oldest settlement known in Denmark, uh, going back 7,000 years. So as you go through these forests and fields, you find uh, burial mounds from the Iron Age, you find bogs where 
uh, thousands of years ago, sacrifices were made, and we know this because of all the artifacts that, that were found there. So it's not just the beauty of nature. There's a very special feeling to these ancient places. So this is a spot that I would walk by on very, very frequently on some of my walks, which were basically every day. Uh, it's an open field that in the summer is, is a field of, of wheat. And in the middle of that field is this one single tree. And this photograph is a little bit uh, deceptive because the distance from that tree to the forest is quite far, the, the forest that you see uh, in the background. So it's very, it's a huge field and just one tree. And for reasons that I cannot even begin to explain, I felt drawn to this tree from the very first time I saw it. There was just something about it that was very, very special to me. And I began to observe it during all the seasons, you know, in the, the fall when it would just be brilliant with, with colors of, of gold. And, uh, and, and as you see in the winter when it was, it's completely uh, bare and so forth. And I began to have, because I felt I had a special relationship with this tree, I began to use this particular spot as a place where I would pause and have time for prayer. So it became extremely important to me. If there was something on my mind, just being here would calm me down. And I felt that I was close to God in this space. And my two daughters began calling this mom's tree because they knew how special it was to me. So when my daughter was in Denmark last winter, she was on the same walk that I used to take. And uh, with all this snow around, she took a picture of my tree. And it is so special to me because all I have to do is look at it and I feel calmer, I feel close to God, and it just, it just means a lot to me. But on the other hand, I can also look at it and be very aesthetically pleased by what I'm seeing because, you know, in, in Scandinavia, the, the, in the wintertime, there's this special blue light and you often see that blue as, as the sun reflects on the snow as well. So when she took, when my daughter Anna took this picture, it, she actually was able to capture these striations, these alternating striations of white where the sun was shining on the snow and the blue where there was shadow. And those striations go all the way back to the tree. And again, just happenstance wise, uh, the tree is in a position where an art historian would say that it reflects one point perspective. That if you started to draw lines from the bottom of the uh, composition of the photograph, they would all meet right there at that tree. So those kind of things were probably random on her part, but what, what came of her photograph was something I think is quite beautiful. So I just wanted to use this as an example of <clears throat> how something can have such deep meaning to us and also be quite beautiful. And I don't know if, if there is anyone who would like to share anything similar. Something that if you turn to when you want the same sort of peace and calm and perhaps an icon? Uh, Lisa, I'm not seeing any hand. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. V uh, Vince, you have your hand raised. Uh, if you'll unmute. There. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Elisa um, and Beth. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I can think, yeah, I, I was thinking as I was looking at this is our, our our memories are like picture books. And, you know, I, I have so many good memories of nature that are spiritual. Um, you know, in the in the mountains in Utah, in the in the mountains and rivers of Idaho. I mean, all these places that I still have vividly etched in my mind uh, are very spiritual and very artistic. I mean, they're they're beautiful places. So that was my only comment. Thank you, Vince. That's 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 lovely. I think I think we all have those places, and even if we don't have 
an actual physical record of them or photograph, um, somehow we go to those special places in our minds and when we need to be there. And I agree. Um, Elisa, Brother John Brendan has his hand raised. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for myself, one of the, in the Celtic term is thin places where mm -hmm. the uh, spiritual and the secular come almost to touch uh, is being in paddling uh, kayak in marshes, especially if I can get out early as there's a mist around the marsh and as the sun is coming up and, and do prayer at that time, watching the sun come up and then the mist disappear from around you. So that's one of my areas in nature that uh, are spiritual for me. Thank you. And thank you for reminding us of that, that thin place concept that the, the Celts uh, talked about, that, because I, I, that's a good description of this place for me. So thank you for reminding us. Oh, Lisa, um, I, I just wanted to, to pop in here. Uh, the juxtaposition of this particular piece with the one previous, um, you know, your title is, does, uh, does artwork need to be religious to be spiritual? And I think these two slides next to each other would, would answer that is no. Um, obviously, the, the subject matter of the previous piece of art was, was intended to be very spiritual. But for me, it just had such a quality of obsequiousness to it. it there was no spirituality in it whatsoever. And then when you see this one in particularly as you were describing it and, you know, the blue, perhaps uh, Mother Mary, uh, I think it's the intention of the piece of art that that makes it spiritual or not, or maybe the, our relationship to it. Um, so maybe not what the painter intends, but this is, um, this is such a beautiful piece and so enhanced by your explanation. Oh, and <laughs> Holly has her hand raised. I need to unmute. Um, Ron and I are sitting here in the den. We each have two very meaningful artworks. I have one I look up at when I leave my Mac. He has one that he looks at from the chair that he did himself. And I'll let you explain his first. Oh. It was. Okay. The <clears throat> subject matter relates back right. to a trip to Wyoming. <clears throat> Yes, it's a, a painting that shows a lake in a small lake, which is reflecting the uh, Sawtooth Mountains in the background. And it has such a calm, beautiful feeling to me of this area, which is about 100 miles north of uh, uh it's in why wyoming actually actually it's i where, don't where think we think you know <laughs> where we were visiting our friends that was in idaho so, i know that's in idaho too. anyway yeah. it, it, it's the it's the picture of the Lake in the background with the background saw, right. Sawtooth Mountains. That's and I was correct. just saying it's about 100 miles north of Sun Valley. Sun Valley, right. So if they're interested in seeing it, I'll get it off the wall. And no, I don't. I, well, I don't know whether they want to see it or not. No, we're. <laughs> anyway, and I have one that I'm looking at that I got in Bozeman, Montana, which is really a river runs through it. It's the river, the mountains, the trees and all. We tend to feel very attuned to spiritual life going out west, which we had done every year up until COVID. And I think we both have two pictures that reflect that. That sounds lovely. And it's, it's wonderful that you have them displayed so that you can just look at them every day and, uh, and enjoy them. That's one. Thank you, Holly. Uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one. Speaking of icons, this is rather icon-like. This is an altarpiece uh, in uh, Santa Maria del Carmina in Pisa. It was created in 1420. 
and it's by the painter Masaccio. And it, uh, it is of the um, two Marys and St. John the Evangelist at the crucifixion of Christ, as you can see. Uh, and I, I'm including it here because I, I, first of all, I'd like to, to make a point about this and, and also the, um, the Carpaccio uh, Supper de Maeus that we saw first. And that is that not only were works of art created to enhance worship and to uh, uh, stimulate people's spirituality within their Christian faith at this time, but also to instruct because people didn't have the uh, copies of the Bible that we that uh, that we have today, and uh, only knew what they learned from the priest, uh, who uh, was the only one to really read to them from from the Gospels, and and also from the visual arts. So the stained glass, the icons, and and the paintings, they had an instructive purpose to them. So we need to also think about that. But one of the really beautiful things about Renaissance art is that it often gives us what is called a sacre conversazione, uh, which means a sacred conversation. And in it, as in this piece that we see here, there is a relationship between the figures, but there are no words because it is completely silent there is a, a communication that is implied, but not one that, that we are meant to hear. So here we have the three figures responding to Christ's death and his execution on the cross. Uh, and we, we enter into their sorrow with them. And they, they are not even relating to one another. They are completely, um, absorbed in their own feelings. And I think one of the things that draws me to this painting in particular, well, two things really. First of all, at this point in, in very early Renaissance painting, uh, it is very often the case that the background is completely just gold gilded without any details. I mean, this is, this is the opposite of what we saw with the um, Charter House uh, painting with Bruges in the background. Um, it is ethereal in that, that it, it doesn't really take place within any time frame or any particular geographic location. It's just simply there. <coughs> and also too, um, you can, even though the woman in the middle is not seen, we don't see her face, her sheer body language tells us how much grief she's in. And she, with the upraised hands and the bowed head <coughs> and the way she's just sort of pulling in to herself uh, in sorrow, it tells, tells everything. So I think here we can enter into the feeling of, of what Christ's mother and his beloved disciple and Mary Magdalene were, were feeling. Um, any, any comments? <coughs> I've got my hand raised. Um, Brother John, at the top of the cross, is that a tree? You know, it's not a tree. And I have tried so many times in, uh, to research this through the years. I've never been able to get an answer. Um, <coughs> Masacho, um often showed the Holy Spirit descending on scenes of crucifixions. And I have never been able to see uh, a dove present. And I'm kind of wondering if that might be um, a, um, an area of the painting that has experienced some damage. Ah. Uh, and yeah. perhaps that the Holy Spirit had been there at some point. The only other, I mean, it does look like a tree but again, I have not been able to find an answer to that question. Yeah, for me, if it was a tree, then the fourth participant is nature <laughs> in the crucifixion. Yeah, or, or the tree of Jesse, the tree of life. Yeah. Um, that's a possibility. I was even thinking about that, but I don't, I don't actually know. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, just as we 
I showed you a contrast and art historians love comparisons. Here's another one that you can contrast with um, with the one we just saw by Masaccio. This is by Peter Paul Rubens. And this is the deposition of Christ from the cross. Um, this is very early 17th century, so it is Baroque. Um, Rubens looked very carefully to um, the gospels to find the details that he should include in this, this um, painting of the deposition. For example, let's see if you can see my cursor here. No, excuse me, here on the left, in this velvet cap is Joseph of uh, Arimathea. And because he was described as wearing very rich clothes or being rich in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, Rubens uh, chose to show him in very beautiful clothing. Um, opposite him on the right is Joseph, uh, excuse me, is Nicodemus uh, mentioned in John's Gospel. And it is the servants at the top who are bearing the weight of Christ. Um, so what inspires me about this painting is that not only does it show the sheer physicality of trying to get Christ down from the cross. I mean, he's, it's, it's, it's a human body that has died, so it's heavy. Um, but also it shows the, the grief and the sorrow of those that are present. Here is Mary, the mother of Christ, and she reaches out. And here is Mary Magdalene. <coughs> and she actually has Christ's um, left foot, his bloodied foot on her shoulder. And she reaches very tenderly up to, to his leg to try and support part of his weight. And behind all of this is the shroud that um, Joseph of Arimathea uh, presumably purchased, paid for, for Christ to be wrapped in. So that, that luminescent white is what illuminates his body, uh, Christ's body, essentially. And, uh, and it is used to kind of help lower him to the ground. Um, I would be interested to hear your response to this, and uh, particularly how it may compare to you, to the, you know, you may find that icon-like panel painting that we just saw the crucifixion more calming and more conducive to your own maybe contemplative prayer. What are your thoughts? anybody I can't see Bessie is there anybody raising their hand this is Doria I just wanted to say can you hear me yes uh huh yes as I look at it it um it's a very intense piece of art and like you said you can see the drama of the moment, the weight, and how they're all pulling to get Christ's body down. And it sort of draws you into it. I almost want to reach my hands out and help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exactly. Well, again, you feel a part of, as you said, the action exactly. of what's happening. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 And and I and that really was one of Peter Paul Rubin's um, uh, intentions with this painting and yes. as with all of his work. So that's a good point, Doria. Thank you. Yes. Um, we're going to move ahead in time here a little bit and, and, and now get into a more secular realm. I don't know if you've ever heard of the painter Keita Kulvitz. Um, you know, one of the things I think that that art can do is to raise our consciousness of of social injustice. And this is what Kata Kolowitz's art was all about. She was born in Germany in 1867. She came from a very politically progressive family. Um, she studied art in Munich and in Berlin. And then she married a physician who only served 
patients who lived in a very impoverished neighborhood um, in Germany. Um, they were all quite poor. And those patients of her husband's also became the models for her work. She worked mostly in the graphic arts, uh, woodcuts, etchings, and so on, but she also did um, sculpture later on in her career. Uh, she became very well known during her lifetime, but also extremely controversial because of the subject matter of her art. Um, she was to have been awarded the, the gold medal at the Berlin Salon in 1897, which would have been extremely prestigious. But Kaiser Wilhelm stepped in and said that her work was subversive and would not allow her to be uh, given the medal. In 1933, she became the first female professor at the Prussian Academy of Art. But very soon after that, the Nazi party decided that her work was um, degenerative, the de de degenerate art and um, forbade it to be exhibited anywhere. Um, <clears throat> one thing you need to know when you look at everything she does is that her first, uh, her son was a soldier in World War I and died um, in battle. And then her grandson um, died the same way in World War II. So she personally was very affected by, by war and by, by, by death and loss. Um, this, by the way, is the artist in front of a self-portrait. Um, there was a, um, a play that was written in 1844 called The Weaver's Rebellion. And it was about the plight of the people who made their living as home weavers in Germany at that time. You can see, for example, here on the right is the, um, the spinning wheel and here is the loom here. And what we see is a mother with her head in her hands and here is her little child who has died, um, presumably by malnourishment and, and, and the horrific living circumstances of, of the, her life. So Kate Apolovitz, um produced a series of, of prints that illustrated um, the play, The Weaver's Rebellion, and, and this is one of them. Um, let me just show you um, another one of her works, and then I'll, I'll ask you if you would like to comment on, on either one of them. This one is, is very timely. Um, you know, if, if a work of art can deepen our spirituality so that we have the ability to be more compassionate and empathetic of the feelings of others, um, then I, I think it's, it's something that has been accomplished that we need to, to, to see. And Kulvitz does that. And of course, this is something that, that is in our lives right now. Um, many of uh, Katie Kulvitz's work had to do with the promote, promotion of women's rights and especially their reproductive right. Um, so she did many works that depicted the misery of not being able to care for the children that the mother did have. But in 1872, paragraph 218 of the German Imperial Criminal Code made abortions punishable by five years in prison. Um, so Kulovitz made this poster of a pregnant woman who you can see by the sunken eyes is quite emaciated and she's got one babe in arms and, and another child to her holding onto her left hand and she's visibly pregnant. And the words in German say down with abortion paragraphs. So she was very much against this and we're trying to um, elevate people's understanding of, of the situation. Um, so what, uh, what are your comments about what works of this type can do to, to enhance our spirituality? And what is your response to the work them, works themselves? Elisa, Nancy Scanlon has had her hand up and I think it, mm -hmm. since the Rubens painting, uh, Nancy, oh. can... Should we go back? Yeah, there. 
Um, I don't want to break the continuity here, and I'll just oh, that's okay. Pass. There. Oh, are you sure? Oh, I was just going to say that if I compare the Versaccio from the disposition picture uh, from a spiritual perspective, I go back to the Versaccio. That's what really brings out a sense of um, sense draws me in. I I really have a sense of loss in that picture. This becomes very busy. There's lots of confusion. And, um, you know, I, I just see this one as busy, not as really eliciting any mm -hmm. type of spiritual um, impact from me. So the composition is just a little bit too too complicated and and um, it's it's hard to know what to, to focus on um, is it's sort of what that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear and you. often these were commissioned. So sometimes, you know, the, the artist doesn't have a time, have a, an awful lot of control over, um, you know, how many, what, what the patron wanted in the picture. But uh, that mm -hmm. was just my, 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 imp, my feelings between the two paintings. Thank you. Sorry, I just said my battery was one running low and I realized the plug was not all the way in the wall. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's go forward. Any comments about um, about Katie Kolovitz's work? I am not seeing any hands raised, Elisa. Okay. Let's I'll wait. Go. Uh, Mike Kusevbeck has his hand up and then Michael Piavani, or perhaps that's okay. Rita. Okay. Well, Michael? yeah, I, Mike? It's Elisa's, yeah, as Elisa said, uh, there is, I think it, we are drawn to um, feel compassion for others through her paintings, uh, that we, we're all one in, in spirit and we're, we're, we share in other sufferings. And, and uh, I think, I think that brings out a good element of spirituality. Uh, um, and uh, I, I mean, it's not, uh, I, and it's not surprising that the Nazis would declare this, you know, forbidden art because it draws so much on our common common humanity. Mm. Which, uh, anyway, that's all I had to. Thank you. And uh, Michael uh, or Rita? It's it's me again. <laughs> it's me again. Um, I, I'm struck by the way of how. Um, our, our sense of justice, especially social justice, is connected with our spirituality. That when you begin to um, follow the gospel, even if you don't do it in a religious way, but in a spiritual way, that you understand, as Mike Kazuvek said, the, the humanity that we all have. Um, and I was also struck when I looked at the poster about the abortion one, the, the one thing that popped into my mind. Um, was actually not about this, but the um, famous Picasso work of the flowers with the hands that he, it was a, a poster he created um, for part of the peace movement for one of the first peace rallies in the early 60s. Um, and it, it's popular all over the world. And I think very few people have any idea of what led him to create that, that he saw a world of peace in which these hands were around flowers rather than guns. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think um, art has also a way of encouraging us to look for justice um, and sometimes at, at a great consequence. You know, she was, uh, this artist was really ostracized for what she did. And yet when you look at this, you know, this is so relevant to what's happening today in the United States. It's like, you know, this should be, this should be reissued with, with an English translation. Thank you. I, 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 yes, that's a great point. It really is. And we're what, 150 years later and we're going through it again. Um, thank you, Rita. Um, this next slide sort of echoes in, in many ways my tree uh, photograph. Um, both in the color palette and in, in the sort of uh, isolation of the figure in the middle, uh, just as the tree is isolated. Anyway, this one's called The Way Home. 
and it's by Ludwig Michelik. Uh, he was a Hungarian painter working mostly in Austria. Uh, this painting is from 1901. Excuse me, it's not a painting, it's a color etching, sorry. Um, he's mostly known for his printmaking, uh, not terribly well known as an artist, did mostly portraiture. Um, but I think there is so much that can be read into this painting in, in terms of a very personal way, um, how we respond to it and what what is in our own souls. Um, and I think maybe for many of us right now, we can really um, respond to it in, in, in a way that we understand because, um, you know, a lot of us are having to have some degree of, of self-imposed um, um, solitude, should we say. And so um, because of the, the quietness of this picture, um, the snowiness of it, the single figure trudging through the snow. I think, I think um, it is something that is both calming and comforting at the same time. Um, any thoughts? I am not seeing any hands raised, Elisa. <clears throat> yeah, I think, you know, sometimes um, I know for myself, in terms of our spirituality, um, being totally alone and in total quiet can seem uh, intimidating. And, um, and I think this picture may be um, something that offers a, a degree of, of spiritual uh, understanding for us. Um, so that's why I included it. Um, I think I only have one more artist. No, a couple more. How are we doing time-wise? Um, I have five till 11. Um, personally, I, I, we can stay on longer if, uh, if your presentation goes on longer. It's not as though the Zoom is going to, to shut us down. Well, I'm, I think uh, I'm nearing the end of my slides, so it shouldn't take too much longer if everyone else is still game to continue. Um, <clears throat> one of the artists that really uh, intrigues me is Henry Osawa Tanner. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He was born in 1859 here in America to an African-American, uh, excuse me, African Methodist church. Um, he, his father was a bishop in that church, and his mother was actually a slave who had escaped with the help of the Underground Railroad. Um, he went on to do incredible things. He went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, studied in Paris, um, had uh, some of his works accepted at the Paris Salon together with Mary Cassatt at the same time, and that is not an easy thing to do to get into the Salon. <clears throat> probably because of his father's position in the church, he did um, tackled quite a few biblical uh, themes and, and subject matter in his paintings. Also did a lot of works that, that, um, that addressed the black experience in America. Um, I'm wondering if anybody can make a guess at the subject of this particular painting. I'm going to go out on a limb and I know we're being recorded. So this, everybody will see how silly this is. Oh no, I'm being saved by Rita. Yes, Rita, you have your hand up. Oh, Betsy, I, I bow to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to the limb first and then I'll come back with the saw. You can both say it at the same time. <laughs> I am, I am just wondering if this is the Annunciation. You and are correct. You're absolutely right. Ah. I was really wrong because I thought this was Tabitha, the raising of Tabitha. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, yeah, but no, Betsy, you, you, you get the prize there. It is the Annunciation and it's an, it's an Annunciation unlike anything I've ever seen in art before. And the interesting thing is the painter Tanner went and spent some years in the Middle East. Um, in the Holy Land because he wanted to understand um, the architecture, 
the clothing, the customs, the culture, everything about that part of the world so that when he did depict a subject that was from the Bible, that he could feel it was more authentic. But what amazes me about this very young teenage girl being um, um, confronted by, by the archangel is the way that um, Gabriel is, is depicted. Can you see that she is yeah. turning to the light? And so unlike the traditional winged archangel that, that we see in, in um, former uh, annunciations in the history of art, this is a like a beam of light. And she looks sort of torn between being a little bit afraid and yet somehow that light seems to be inspiring her and calming her to a certain extent. And I just find this, this just amazing. Um, let me show you one more. But Elisa, um, yeah. Grace has her hand up too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Grace? Yes. Uh, I, I had also thought the Annunciation, uh, because of the uh, form uh, of the figure, and I had just felt it and the brilliant light to the left. But I think the painting is quite master, masterfully done. The, um, the textures in the, in the bed clothes, the robe the, are amazingly done uh, all the way around. The boldness of the red in the back is just accentuates everything. Uh, I think it's a, a wonderful painting. I'm a very, very emotional painting. Thank you. Yes, yes. And uh, Elisa, is that a, a, a blue robe off to Mary's left? Or is that just the way it's showing up on my, my map? A, a blue it, what, Betsy? Well, I'm, I'm just wondering if the, the robe draped over the piece of furniture to Mary's left is intended to be the, the blue uh, robe that she would move into once she accepts uh, her role in history. I don't see blue uh, okay. in my reproduction. It could just be how it's showing up on my on my map. I think so. Are you talking about this this right here? Uh, no. If you'll go over to uh, yeah. keep moving your your cursor to the right. No, the uh, the other way. Keep this? no away from Gabriel. Away. Yes. Keep going. Keep going. And then now drop down. That. Oh, there. Oh, interesting. I never even noticed that before. I just thought that was a shadow, but you're right. It does look like a piece of blue fabric. That could well be an attempt at iconographical reference to, as you said, the, the, the traditional blue of the Virgin Mary. Um, good point. Excellent. Thank I'll you. look into that, Betsy. <laughs> See what I can find out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just compare her garment to the one worn by the uh, Charter House of Bruges uh, Virgin Mary, and um, you'll see that, that Tanner's approach is quite different, quite different. Another painting by Tanner that I'm giving you so that you can make a little bit of a comparison. Anybody guess what the, um, the subject of this is? I see no, oh, uh, Brother John oh, Rickman. Brother John? I think it's the, the calming of the storm or the nuts, lowering the nuts, but uh, the calming of the storm when Christ comes up, although Christ was supposed to be in the stern of the boat. You're absolutely right. But um, at this particular moment in the painting, he is capturing when Christ is actually walking on the water. Yes, yes. And Yes. I think oh, okay. my opinion is this is the figure of Christ. Uh, and these are the disciples in the, the boat. Um, because the title is the disciples see Christ walking on the water from 1907. Oh, right. So, uh, you know, look at look at the way he's depicted Christ. And then let's go back and then look at yeah, uh, you know, so I'm wondering if this was uh, Tanner's way of, of 
capturing two dimensionally on canvas, a, a way of showing the divine um, or a representative of the divine, uh, which I find kind of interesting. But then from there, I just happened to see these two paintings and these are the last two. So I won't be uh, keeping you too much longer. These are two paintings, because um, I wanted to kind of bring us more up into our contemporary time, uh, that also show a kind of divine presence in the, in the guise of, of, a, of a, uh, a light, a, a column of light, I should say. This one on the left is by an artist named Hollis Sigler, and it's called To Kiss the Spirits. It's from, um, no, excuse me. This one, it's from 1993, the one on the right, known as, she's known as a naive painter because she's not really trained as a, a painter. Um, but during the time she painted this, she was uh, battling cancer and uh, her work uh, has a very highly emotional um, uh, sort of, of, of slant to it. Um, and you see down here at the bottom, there's a, a woman who's beginning to, and this is a spiral staircase, she's beginning to climb the staircase and she starts to lift her arms a little bit higher and higher. And then eventually those arms turn into wings. And then when she gets to the top of this column of light, she's able to actually um, go off into, into the universe and, um, and take flight. This one on the left, <coughs> is called White Fire. It's from 1930, and it's by Agnes Pelton. She was originally from Germany, but spent most of her life in the U.S. So she studied at Pratt, um, <coughs> did quite a bit of work uh, painting Native Americans. Um, she was known as a transcendentalist painter. Um, and of course, the transcendentalists followed the philosophy that uh, believe that divinity was just pervasive in all people and and in nature, um, and she did. She talked quite a bit about about light, especially in California where she lived. And this, I found this quote. <coughs> it says the vibration of this light, the spaciousness of these skies enthralled me. I knew there was a spirit in nature as in everything else, but here in the desert it was especially bright. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'm wondering if she considers this, this bright light, this white fire to be representative of, of the divine and uh, couldn't help but compare both of these paintings to, to Tanner's paintings. Um, and it's interesting because if you listen to people who have had near-death experiences, what you hear so many of them say is that when they did encounter the divine, they saw it as, as a bright, pervasive light um, that grew as they, as they came closer to it. So uh, yes, that is all I have to show you, but any final comments or comments on these last pieces? I am not seeing any hands raised, Gray. Uh, no, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, Elisa. Um, Lee has her hand up. And then after Lee, Rita. Um, Lee, go ahead, I think you're muted. Well, I'm gonna talk through John's uh, PC. Oh, okay. <laughs> all, all of this art reminds me of, of a saying attributed to St. Francis, which is uh, preach, the, <clears throat> preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, art, whether it's seeking to portray something specifically biblical or not, I think when we encounter art that moves us and we move into a spiritual place of communication with that piece of art, it is it is preaching something to us. It is moving or opening us to something. So I that it just the whole talk today made me think of that quote: "Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words." Absolutely, that's I, I want. That's wonderful. That is a great comment. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, and then uh, let's see, uh, Rita or Michael. Can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, this has been a fantastic uh, journey uh, into an awareness of how the spiritual is part of our everyday life. Uh, Matthew Fox, in one of his first books called On Becoming a Musical, Mystical Bear, says spirituality is a radical response to life. And he talks about the artist as one of those creative people who help us to see the radicalness of life and the divine within that life. And your presentation has, for me, uh, just re uh, ignited, energized, uh, enthused me with that awareness of how artists and art and photography all help us to respond to life and to be open to seeing where the divine is within our very lives. So thank you. Aww. Thank you, Michael. That's lovely. I appreciate your comments very much. Thank you. Well, and I have one to add, uh, uh, Lisa. Uh, also, a thank you from the bottom of my heart. This was more than I could have possibly imagined or hoped for because you yourself embody that unique blend of what is religious and spiritual and they're not the same but you embody them both with such graciousness and the education that you gave us all today artists that i had not known but now i will research because i i, I want to know more about them so i thank you thank you thank you thank you you did a wonderful job thank you thank, thank you rita i appreciate that alisa um mike Kozabek has his hand up too okay well I and then, um, <clears throat> After Mike, I think, Doriel, you had a comment. Well, I'm hesitant to, to uh, follow those great summaries and, and inspiration from Michael and Rita. I thought, you know, I agree with that. It's very good. But I, I mean, I can't help but uh, talk about another the painting that came before with the coming home of the man walking in the snow. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yeah, I just engendered a lot of um, memories for me. And you know, walking in the deep snow with the light at home, but you know, many of some of us have, have with the physical ailments. They there's a man that's walking with a cane, I believe it was, and he has a bag in his left hand. He's carrying a bundle, and he's trudging through this, and yet, and that he's and he's approaching the light, which we do, as we've shown here in 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 life or even after life, you know, that that the light is 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 drawing him there and he, despite his struggles um he he is he is able to do that i thought that was wonderful you know that brings I was, up i was just going to say it brings up an interesting idea and that is that maybe the 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 home that he's going to is 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 symbolic of our ultimate home you know that that right. trudging through the snow is is not easy and it's kind kind of scary if it's dark but but once you get into that light then you're home again and it's and then you're comfortable so um, I, I just wondered if you also did any ekphrastic poetry connecting the words with art in any of your classes or because it's a way of drawing and we have many artists that at the Boniface this is terrific and and you could spend some time in any one painting for minutes and drawing out our feelings and inspiration for them and you could combine the words in art and I think that would be even a great opportunity for a live class sometime I think that would be a lot of fun, really. Yeah, because we do have some works that that are that um, of at least two very well-known Sarasota artists, and um, it would be fun to talk about them and delve a little further into their meaning. I think that would be great. And but, and and art, yeah, art by Boniface members as well. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And get the artists to talk about them. Right. Yes. Terrific idea. Thank you. Um, Doriel, did you have your hand up? I, I wasn't sure. Yes, I just wanted to thank you, Elisa. And this was wonderful. And um, 
an eye opener. What uh, Michael and Rita said also pulled it together for me. <laughs> Excuse me. This was a great experience. Thank you. And um, I had to comment on the man walking towards the light as well in the snow. <clears throat> right away, it brought to mind the Christmas carol, Good, Good King Wenceslas. And um, I always find there is something in that music that pulls me together and realize that he was uh, the spirit bringing light and love and caring to those people who are in need. So th thank you. Thank this you, was Doria. wonderful. Thank you, Doria. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, if, if anybody wants a list of, of the artists, um, just let me know. And I, I know someone mentioned they wanted to kind of explore them a little further. So I, I'm yeah. happy to send you a list if you'd like. <clears throat> Amy, Amy have her hand up. Thank you. Thank um, you, Betsy. Amy yeah. has her hand up. Sure, Amy, I would yeah. Hi, Amy. Uh, thank, hi. Thanks, Elisa. I think it was great that you brought up that spirituality is not just peacefulness, because at first it was kind of looking like that. You know, when you looked at the tree and the meadow, that you felt more peaceful, because spirituality is also getting people active and getting them to see, as you said, where things are unfair and kind of an incitement to do something about it. So there are the two, it's just such a broad picture of what spirituality really is. It isn't just some place to make you feel peaceful. Absolutely, that's, that's such a good thing to mention. It really is because I mean, often art incites us to, um, to tackle issues that we don't really feel comfortable with and different things that are happening in society and, and in our culture. So I agree, Amy, thank you for that. So as we close, um, and before I say a final thank you, Elisa, uh, Rita, did you want to give a preview of uh, upcoming Second Saturdays? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, the, um, uh, slow down, Rita. Okay, August presentation is going to be uh, Reg Irvine on MOB, on what it's like to have um, spiritual companionship and breakfast and prayer all put together. Um, and in September, Anne Moore will be our presenter and she's going to talk on the spirituality of recovery. And on and, and October, it will be John Garisto who will be presenting on what it means to be healed. So uh, it's always the second Saturday, hence our name, the second Saturday <laughs> spirituality on Zoom. So, um, and I, again, Elisa, thank you. As always, these are recorded um, in a few days, they'll be posted up on the CST website. Um, I would encourage uh, you, this is one to look at again. Um, there's so much I wanna see um, in those, in the slides that uh, Alisa gave to us. So this is a good way that you can go back and spend some time. And then you can always just, you know, chat up Alisa. She's available to us, aren't we lucky? So I'm, I'm you. very available right now. <laughs> Call me anytime. <laughs> well, Alisa, this has been a joy and what an education you've given us all. Um, I think at least personally, I know next time I look at a painting, I will have a completely different set of eyes. So uh, thank you very much. And um, as Rita mentioned, this will be uh, posted on, I hope both the St. Boniface and the CSG website. So uh, we can go back and view it there. So thank you and uh, goodbye.